It's always hard to tell what the roots of things are, but uh, uh, my mother particularly was very active in social welfare, and my father to a limited degree. Uh, and uh, it's my first participation in it was uh, as a member of the High Y in Glendale High School. Mm. And uh, we did, we high school kids did some social work at that time, we led uh, or we participated in leading groups of even younger school children. And uh, sometimes there would be a uh, discussion of a Bible passage or something serious like that, and sometimes they'd be out playing a game of some kind with them. And uh, then I continued with that YMCA work in college. Where I was president of the YMCA, and uh, there was a certain amount of social work that we did there. 
and I was on the board of the YMCA at UCLA. Uh, that was my first volunteer board position. And uh, it didn't exactly go on from there. I guess the next volunteer work I did was for the community chest. Mm -hmm. And the firm encouraged uh, its younger people to get out and ring a few doorbells. Uh, we, we made uh, calls to downtown office be, office workers uh, primarily. Was that when Lynn Mullet was there? Yeah, I don't know. I didn't know Lynn at that time. I was on a pretty low rung of the uh, <laughs> community chest ladder. Uh, I'm talking about probably about 1931, 32. I don't know whether Lynn was there at that mm -hmm. time or I not. I think so. I think so too. Mm -hmm. But that was just taking an assignment and uh, making you know, maybe six office calls, uh, people up and down the street. Mm. And uh, I guess it wasn't until somewhat later on that I began to be uh, sought after for uh, board positions and things of that kind. Um, what can you can you mention some of the positions you held in? And the ones you've worked with? Well, there weren't an awful lot. I'm talking with Ethel about this. She said, Why are they interviewing you? And I said, <laughs> <laughs> They should interview her. Yeah. Yes, please. I said, I think the... she was uh, during a lot of uh, those earlier years in my office and the middle years in my office. I didn't have an awful lot of time to uh, spend in uh, volunteer work. Uh, in some way, and I think it was through people that I worked with professionally who got into uh, community service because they were leaders in the community. I think it was through them, really, that I uh, became more involved in, uh, in United Way, and I wound up at uh, quite a young age. I can't tell you what it was, but as a, a chairman of one of the divisions, the Advanced Gifts Division. And then it wasn't too long after that that uh, I filled a, and I was much too young for it really, and not experienced enough, I filled a void. Uh, I know now how those things work. I filled a void and became chairman, and I became campaign chairman of the community mm. chest. And I really didn't know my way around at all. Uh, I think Cecil Feldman was the uh, mm. uh, was the uh, executive executive at that time. And uh, I'd forgotten when Cecil Feldman came in. There. Can you remember that? No, I'm I'm very bad about placing events with the early with the time, the early forties. Well, it would have had to be because Lynn Mullet was at the end of his. Uh, period of when, when I was yeah, I'm not that. sure. I'm not sure Cecil was the executive at the time I was campaign chairman. He may have been the campaign executive. That's more likely. That he came during the war years. Yeah. I believe that I was, because you can check this, uh, I believe I must have been campaign chairman around 1950. Mm -hmm. Somewhere in there. I think Lynn remained as executive and good part of I think Lynn was still executive and Cecil was a. Uh, I know he wasn't. He wasn't, no? Mm -hmm. Because the. Uh, um, I started working under Ethel mm -hmm. uh, in about 48 or 49 in the community chest. And uh, that was just at the end of the, the Lynn Moore. So that my real life history was to be Feldman Well, um, I can't tell you exactly how I became involved in the United Way movement, but I know Ernie Lobicky was. Uh, 
prime mover, prime, prime reason I was involved in that. After my campaign chairmanship, I was on the uh, board of the community chest for two or three years, I mean two years, maybe just one year as the uh, as the immediate past campaign chairman. And I think it was that during that, and Ernie Lobicki, Ernie Lobicki was a good friend of mine. This, again, was one of those, I referred to professional relations. He became very a very important man at Title Insurance and Trust Company, and they were one of the firm's most important clients. I was doing a good deal of work for Title Insurance and Trust Company, uh, and uh, got to know Ernie when he was a, really before he was, came to title insurance, he worked for a title guarantee and trust, and then they were merged and he became an important man at title insurance. And I worked a great deal with him, and I guess it was kind of natural that between my knowing him personally and working with him as a lawyer, uh, and um, my involvement as campaign chairman at that time, that uh, I really became heavily involved with him in the uh, earlier stages of United Way. And uh, although I don't think I was, uh, I'm not sure whether I was ever on the United Way board. I guess I was, but uh, I don't remember. <laughs> I'm a founder anyway. <laughs> I'm told I am. <laughs> uh, as being on the board, of, uh, or being a substantial volunteer of the uh, agencies involved in social work, uh, I really haven't had a lot of that. Uh, uh, Weren't you on Ethel, one time? Yes. Um, okay. <laughs> there's a, uh, you know, there's a professional side of my volunteer work, and I don't know whether you call that social service or not, but uh, uh, I was, um, a little bit involved in uh, legal aid here, but really uh, that involvement grew out of my activities with the American Bar Association. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, came about this way that I was elected the trustee of the Los Angeles County Bar Association. And um, uh, at a time when it had uh, uh, shortly before that become a uh, countywide association with uh, a number of local affiliates, mm. but they'd worked out a joint membership arrangement which greatly enlarged the size of the county bar association. And also the county bar had gotten out of its original uh, ethnic discrimination in which it was impossible for a Negro attorney to become a member of the, of the county bar and to become a it had become a uh, really a representative county association. Uh, and um, following my terms as trustee of that association, I was selected an officer, and that put me on a ladder for four years. And, and I became president of the county bar association. Uh, someplace along the line, uh, I became involved in uh, bar work on a national level, and uh, I think this is a good example. It's worth probably worth suggesting it as an example of what happens to, to people anyway. Uh, the first people that I was thrown with nationally were uh, were the National Legal Aid. Defender Association board members. <clears throat> and the way it, the way that happened was that uh, I had a, a close friend in law school who was from Chicago, named Bill Avery, uh, and uh, we belonged to the same little law club at Harvard. There were eight members from each class and each of the law clubs, and they were, they existed for the purpose of moot court competition. And uh, uh, Bill and I, he was from Chicago University, 
from Chicago and Princeton, and here I was from Los Angeles and Berkeley, and we became very good friends. Uh, along the time I'm talking about, he was a very active uh, member of the board of the National Legal Aid and Defender Association, and he suggested my name as a, as a new board member, and they were looking for somebody from the West Coast, particularly Los Angeles, and I was pleased to do it. One thing I've I have been as open-minded about accepting invitations to do these things. So, uh, so I said, fine, I'd uh, be interested in doing it. Uh, that put me in contact right away with some very interesting people who included... Uh, you want names like this? You want me to uh, indicate connections? Morrison Martin of uh, White and Case was president of the the legal aid organization at that time. He became president of the Los Angeles, of the American Bar Association later on. Uh, Bill Gossett of the uh, Hughes, uh, the original Charles Evan Hughes firm in New York, uh, was on the board. He was a very interesting man. He's still very much alive. He's married. He married uh, Charles Evan Hughes' daughter. Both of them became good friends of ours. He became president of the American Bar Association later on. And a man named Ted Voorhees from uh, Philadelphia. Uh, he was a leading lawyer in the leading, one of the two or three leading firms in uh, Philadelphia. Uh, people of that type uh, and that caliber. Uh, and uh, I stayed with that and became president of the association. Uh, acted for two years, I guess, I uh, was reelected and acted in that capacity. And about then was the beginning of the of the uh, government-supported legal services operation, which was first in the Office of Economic Opportunity. Mm -hmm. You may possibly remember. It. Sergeant Shriver was the was the appointee who headed that office, and uh, they established a, a nationwide advisory committee, and I was placed on that, mm. uh, and uh, appeared in uh, Washington D.C. two or three or four times a year for meetings of that committee, and sometimes they were fairly stormy because we didn't think that legal services was getting enough attention and enough cooperation out of, out of the OEO. They had a lot of other fish to fry besides this. Uh, so we, um, and uh, we weren't always sure that the, the legal services man in the OEO office was uh, entirely up to uh, what his responsibilities were. It turned out that uh, we were wrong, I think now, in, in that latter feeling because it was a bureaucracy and uh, the legal services man, I think, one after another, I think they were very able people. I remember the first one was Clint Bamberger from Baltimore and then one of his successors, his name is Gibson right, right now, is became moved out here later on and uh, taught at USC and is now a, uh, now a federal judge mm. here. Uh, they were all very able people, and they were all working very hard to get legal services its share of the its full share of the funds that were available and the attention of the other bureaucrats there. But uh, we had very, very interesting and very active meetings, and we took a very active part in that. Um, one of the one of the men that I was thrown in contact with, it was Orison Martin's best friend in New York, was Whitney North Seymour, who was a leading lawyer in uh, one of the leading firms there, who had formerly been uh, uh, way up in the Justice Department in Washington, D.C. Uh, and uh, he always seemed to be on nominating committees, and he always wanted to nominate me for that. <laughs> vacancies, and I wound up on the, through him, I wound up on the uh, board of the American 
Bar Foundation, which is a research organization uh, affiliated with the American Bar Association with its own board, and in due course became president of that. Uh, so I had uh, quite a lot of that type of uh, professional so social service experience, uh, much more so than I did with the local welfare type. Well, but it had a, you know, a very, a very direct connection in the sense that the legal aid services during the 60s and 70s moved in an entirely different direction than they had in the That's the right. Yeah. It was a, it was, and it was a very painful change. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I was uh, placed on the board of the local, well, let me back up a little bit, as I remember it, and this won't be entirely accurate, I'm sure, but as I remember it, the OEO funds were not used primarily to support existing legal aid mm -hmm. services. Mm -hmm. They were used primarily to establish new legal aid services. And uh, I was, I went on the board of the, of the new one that was formed here in Los Angeles, and uh, it was not an entirely satisfactory experience from my standpoint. Uh, well, we, uh, we did not have strong leadership as I look back on it now, and uh, and the the, the, list, the very small employee group is certainly small, but it it quickly became composed of political appointees. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, the, the work that it accomplished, I think it, I think it served a useful purpose. I think it did what it, some at least, of what it was supposed to, but it did it not very effectively or efficiently, and there seemed to be a lot of hangers-on on the staff. I shouldn't say a lot, maybe three or four, but I don't think the staff was any bigger than six or eight, who uh, were completely inept, not lawyers, but other people who, who seemed to have been given their jobs uh, because they knew somebody. Or because the money was there and had to spend. And had to be spent. <laughs> well, of course, that is a theme that I've encountered yeah. over and over <laughs> again in my lifetime, Kay. And, <laughs> but uh, uh, that was... Uh, as I look back at it, I really should be ashamed for having served on that board without uh, uh, demanding uh, accountability from the people didn't who they, were running uh, it. Didn't they, uh, though, didn't that separate movement, though, have a very distinct um, effect on legal aid, sir, the old legal aid organization in the sense that it it moved it into, say, the kinds of class action suits and so on that weren't prevalent before? Yes, there's no doubt about that. <laughs> uh, the, I really don't feel qualified, although I sure, certainly should be, uh, uh, to uh, pull that history together in my mind. <clears throat> when I first became involved with the legal aid movement on the national scale. There were some offices that were doing the old style legal aid and mm -hmm. with the help of attorneys who were not overly qualified uh, they perhaps knew enough law to do the things they were doing, but quite often they were people who were kind of worn out and didn't have a lot of zip left, and that, that unfortunately was true in Los Angeles at that time. A very nice man was the head of the legal aid office, but he had no imagination or enthusiasm or, or strength left, really. Uh, and when I was active in nationally, there were some places that were moving ahead mm. quite rapidly and were getting into the class action uh, 
field and uh, matters of that kind, the new style. But uh, the legal aid movement was then encountering a great deal of opposition from the local lawyers. Mm -hmm. it, it, remember that? It seems, mm -hmm. it seems strange, but by the time I get, got involved with it, people that, of the type I have, uh, the specific people that I've been referring to, Martin and Gossett and Voorhees uh, particularly, had been uh, going around the country and appearing, making local appearances and selling the legal aid message to the local, trying to sell it to the local bar associations mm. because, uh, and they had, by that time, they had succeeded in getting legal aid organizations established in all of the larger cities of the country. Uh, and the movement was then beginning to try to get established in the, the next tier of cities. Mm. And tremendous local resistance was encountered. The lawyers that spoke up uh, in those local situations were the ones that opposed it, that thought they were losing their bread and butter. Mm by giving free legal services to people who would otherwise be their clients. And there was a lot of pulling and hauling on that. Uh, but the entire leadership in the uh, national movement was from the kind of people that volunteers at the board level, that the kind of people I've been talking about, Avery and so forth. Plus, uh, first Emory Brownell, who was the, the uh, chief executive in Chicago, and then Junius Allen, who succeeded him, uh, fighting, uh, try, fighting the good fight and uh, trying to help those get established. Then, uh, when the federal money came into it, there was a great growth in the localities and also in the national organization, and an entire new breed of people became members of the national organization, and they had fire in their eyes. They had some money, uh, and uh, they had a contempt for the people who had been in it all along because they, they'd done such a poor job and had not covered the ground that had to be covered and so forth and so forth. And, of course, they had no understanding of the financial uh, difficulties under which the legal aid organizations had been working. They were riding high because they, they had federal money mm -hmm. that, that was coming in. And uh, they, there was a great tendency to say, well, we, you know, the hell with the, those organizations that have been out there all this time and doing a lousy job. Uh, we're going to take, take it all over now, both locally and they did the same thing nationally. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had some stormy times in my last year or two, year and a half as president. Uh, and uh, the movement lost Junius Allison at that time, who was a very high-class man. I was very fond of him personally, and was probably prejudiced, but he was not a driver, and uh, the, the, new, the new breed, these young lawyers and impatient ones uh, just thought he was a millstone around the neck of the movement and mm. and they they actually took over control of the uh, of the National Legal Aid and Defender Association because the structure was such it was a democratic organization and as these people came in from all of their offices and became members of it why they could outvote the old old timers and uh, then uh, it became an organization of that group. By that I mean the working lawyers, rather than an organization of the do-gooders, which, <laughs> which it had been before, all of the working lawyers belonged to it. But that really reflected the whole social thing. It did indeed. It was in every aspect it, of it. It did life. indeed, and we had uh, several stormy meetings, And uh, but I was in favor of the, of the thing happening. I didn't like it. I didn't want it to happen in a revolutionary manner, uh, and it actually didn't happen in a revolutionary manner, but it happened within the framework of the established organization. But uh, 
I guess I was the last volunteer president in that. No, there's been there have been one or two since then, but uh, the, I was succeeded by one of the working group, and that was true for several years. And it wasn't until several years later that a volunteer again hmm. became president of the organization, and that was a man from Boston who hmm. was who had served his time and uh, whom everybody admired. And by that time, they kick the rascals out was, uh, was a little retreat from that, and they were willing to have have uh, volunteers participate, and they are now. But it's very much a, uh, a workers' organization now. Well, you know, I think, Maynard, wouldn't you have said, though, that that happened in the 60s? It seemed to me that the agency generally, and that was, you know, the United Way agency yes. and everybody else, um, the money thrown at them yeah. made them staff conscious, not volunteer conscious. The the staff's attitude toward what they how they did their job changed. Well, the money wasn't coming from the volunteers anymore. That's right. They were they were, the volunteers were left in the position of of, of uh, running the organization without contributing much to it except their wisdom and that was, wasn't always appreciated uh, and mm -hmm. it probably shouldn't have been appreciated in many instances well i don't know but they it seems to me to see that that we're now going through the throes of withdrawing from that yes and and that's painful i think mm -hmm. uh, both uh, rapid change is is painful no matter which direction it's in and uh, well and the professionals you see really got a a feeling that they weren't responsible to their own boards. Yeah. And and that's that's right. A thing that's hard to correct. Well, and uh, uh, when the board was had uh, had abandoned or was abandoning its uh, its uh, historical function of uh, both. Uh, expanding the movement and finding funds when there were when that was no those functions were no longer being done why there wasn't much left for the board to do That's right. and the the day-to-day -day work was of course done by the, by this legal staff so uh, sure the board can still do community relations of one kind and another but uh, but it, no, they went all the way and, and uh, it was inevitable. At the same time, and I, I really can't remember exactly how this happened, but at the same time, the national money began to be funneled in part to the old-style legal aid organizations. And mm -hmm. uh, the Los Angeles Legal Aid Foundation, for example, which was the old one, uh, did begin getting some federal funds. And I can't remember whether uh, that was the result of a local situation in which the, the the federally established organization turned out to be a dud and really mm. turned up its heels and died, uh, whether that left a, an allocation available for the Los Angeles Legal Aid Foundation or not. I think there were actually there were two federal local organizations formed and I was with one of them and the other one was no better as I understood it. Uh, but I think uh, a, a portion of the federal money that was available did begin to be distributed to the old style legal aid organizations. Uh, the, other, the other side of the uh, activity of the national organization, that is the National Legal Aid and Defender Association, was the defender side. That was added historically. It was a legal aid, national legal aid, and then they added the defender side because there was a motion to get public defenders appointed. Los Angeles was one of the, California, well, Los Angeles was one of the very earliest cities that had a public defender. Well, I think we had to have a million or more people, didn't we? 
I don't in order to have I don't remember, <laughs> Francis. And was that a was that a constitutional provision yes. in California? Uh, then uh -huh. finally it was changed. Yes. And so other cities like San Francisco, San Diego. But the national. That's why we had the only one. Yeah, I see. But the national organization uh, changed its name to include Defender and uh, hired a staff man of considerable stature to uh, plug uh, state defender mm. organizations all over the country and he spent several years at that. Mm. Uh, it, was, it was partially successful, but I think it did result, in, it did have an indirect effect of creating great many more local public defender offices around the country. The public defenders are now an integral part of the, of the organization. The public defender offices belong to it just the way legal aid offices belong to it. Mm -hmm. And the, it has a, internally it has a dual structure. It has a, a council from the legal aid side and a council from the public defender side. And then they, they are concerned primarily with their well, the respective responsibilities, but together they constitute the, the governing body for the uh, combined organization. Well, then, there's some really important things to involved out of those early... Oh, yeah. ...organizations that started yeah. out in yeah. the early 60s. Um, yes, they have, and they've, they've stuck there, and they've, they've been both very active throughout the entire country. Yeah, and, and doing a good job. Um, Mina, you have a uniqueness in your background that, that um, I'd like you to touch on. You're on so many foundation boards. How did those evolve in Los Angeles County, and, and have they affected the social services? Well, I'm not on that many, <laughs> really. Well, you're on significant ones. Well, I think there's only two. Um, and uh, the more significant of that and the more interesting is the Haynes Foundation. Uh, I got on that again through professional connections. Mm. Uh, my, uh, <coughs> the man who became chiefly responsible for me in the office, uh, who was my mentor, as it were, was a partner named Paul Fussell, who had been president of the County Bar Association. Uh, a brilliant man uh, for whom I worked directly for several years in my, through my, in my apprentice, apprentice days. And uh, he was on the board of the Haynes Foundation. And uh, through him, I did uh, some legal work for Francis Lindley, who was uncle and, and uncle by marriage were the founders of the Haynes Foundation and he'd been president of the, he was on the board and president. Uh, I'd worked for Francis uh, on some family family planning tax matters and when Paul Fussell retired uh, he uh, got off the board and Francis asked me to go on in his place, which I did. And uh, then when Francis, the time came when Francis wanted to give up the presidency, and I became president in his place. Incidentally, uh, the time came for me to give up the presidency, and I succeeded in getting it passed on to Francis's son, Francis, Francis Haynes and Lindley Jr., who's great aunt and uncle by marriage were the founders of uh, the foundation. Uh, I was pleased to go on it because I, uh, well, obviously I had uh, a belief, either a belief that public service was a good thing or a, or a liking for it, one or the other, or both. Uh, and uh, have enjoyed being on it, partly because of the kind of work it does and partly because of the association with the, the people involved. And I'm talking not only about fellow board members, but uh, the small staff.
staff and also the, uh, the people that uh, apply for grants, some of whom, like Francis, I'm very glad to, to talk with about any foundation matters, and uh, we have to turn them down, perhaps. But um, both those and those that, uh, and sometimes those that receive grants are very interesting and become good friends. Uh, the only other found, I think I'm right in saying the only other foundation that I've served uh, directly on the board is the Willamette K. Day Foundation. She's a, she was the daughter of uh, William Keck. Oh, good. And uh, uh, during her lifetime, she was, well, during her lifetime, she established the Willamette K Day Foundation, and I went on the board of that, and have continued ever since. Uh, you, you may remember that she had uh, a long, long drawn-out series of battles with her brother Howard Keck, and at the time that uh, she formed the foundation, it, she had nothing but. And the foundation received nothing but superior oil company stock, which was the, the old Keck family stock. She was, she owned some of that herself, and she was also the beneficiary of one of the trusts that uh, old Mr. Keck created for his children, and that was all superior oil stock. So her entire future, financial future, was wrapped up in superior oil. And at one point, she decided to put a, uh, some of it, a fairly modest amount, really, in, a, in her own foundation, then began to regret it. I, I guess I set the foundation up. Then she began to regret it afterwards because it wasn't big enough to be of any significance. But when, uh, as it eventuated, and when the, uh, when uh, uh, the battles occurred and when Superior Oil became more and more valuable, when They turned a lot of, I guess they turned virtually all of that superior oil company stock over, that is the foundation did, and it's all it's still a small foundation, it is more significance now. Hmm. And uh, it's, uh, it's largely a family foundation, uh, giving to the charities that the family is interested in. Well, the Kent Foundation is separate from that, isn't it? It's separate for it, and from it, and it is uh, infinitely larger. Oh, I know it. Isn't it, isn't it the biggest one uh, west of the Mississippi? Or I, I, uh, uh, well, it was until the uh, what's the one in San Francisco now that hmm. the, the new one that I'll think of the name of it. There. Another that came from another oil company. Oh, I know. You know the one I'm it's talking. Part of the Green Sisters. Yeah, yeah, it's I know been involved in the heavy lit litigation up there. It's probably bigger than the Tank Foundation. Anyway, uh, the interesting thing about the Tech Foundation, which you might not know, is that uh, it is apparently irrevocably established by some legal document. That, maybe I'm wrong about being irrevocable, but at any rate, Mr. Tech wanted a provision, and it still exists, that each of his descendants is entitled, if he wishes, to become the trustee of that foundation at age 21. <laughs> and the result is that uh, uh, a good many of his progeny uh, uh, are... Uh, trustees of that foundation. I think that's true of, uh, of at least three of uh, Willametta's children, mm. uh, including Robert Day, who is uh, who works very seriously at the, at the Keck Foundation Matters, mm. as, as well as providing the administrative things that are needed for the Willametta K. Day Foundation. Well, do they, uh, do you think the involvement of these foundations has had any 
real effect on the development of social welfare services? Okay, <clears throat> probably your judgment on that is uh, is a good deal better than mine. I don't know the extent to which our social welfare agencies are supported by foundations. I w I would judge that they get more from foundations now than they ever have before. Well, I think that's true. Um, and perhaps a larger percentage of uh, their funding <coughs> from foundations than ever before. It you would found? still be a fairly small percentage, wouldn't it, of their oh, sure. total support. Uh, as, how long has it been since the, uh, they have this uh, organization of philanthropy that yeah, foundations belong to? Um, well, it's been, it has been a, an organization worthy of the name uh, uh, in, the, I think in my personal view uh, uh, in the last uh, seven or eight, nine years, something like that. Uh, before that, uh, it was founded by a, a man with a vision named Joe Dempsey, yeah. <laughs> and um, he ran it as a kind of a... credit for having had the vision and the energy to get started, uh, but it, um, it really came to life after Joe retired uh, from that particular activity and, um, uh, and Lon Burns was selected as the executive. Uh, quite evident to me that the, there were volunteers connected with, uh, with SCAP. Uh, during Dempsey's time, there were uh, willing and anxious when the time came to take leadership in, in helping build that organization. But that really didn't occur while Joe was there. Mm -hmm. uh, when Joe left, which he did voluntarily on his, on his own account, it may, have, may not have been a wise move for him, but uh, I don't know that. At any rate, he left, and uh, immediately a search was made, and uh, Lon Burns was located, and has been a very great asset to SCAP since then. And one of the ways in which Lon has been a great asset, the most important way, I think, is to uh, insist on uh, various roles being properly played. Okay. He's the executive. He's not the board of trustees. And uh, it immediately began the process of the Board of Trustees becoming responsible, having responsibility, exercising responsibility, and that, as we all know, is a snowball kind of a process. Uh, so now it is a, uh, it has a very dedicated board, and uh, they're very lively and have a good program, and uh, uh, it's a very successful and useful organization. How big is the membership? Uh, it's over a hundred. Okay. It, it includes, uh, it includes uh, private foundations and corporations with either associated foundations or corporate giving programs, mm. which are doing the same kind of thing. And it includes uh, the, the one community foundation that we have, the California Community Foundation. And now it includes, uh, it, there are a few uh, members who are religious organizations where a church or a church organization has a uh, has a giving, not fundraising, but a giving mm -hmm. uh, activity, mm -hmm. <coughs> which is sufficiently separate from the rest of its activities so that it has a very close relationship to private foundations. 
to the normal private foundation, mm -hmm. and and there are three or four of those church organizations that are now members of, of okay. SCAP. Mm -hmm. We've been very careful. But we uh, the organization has been very careful to try to uh, admit any organization which has largely a identical interests with what we started with, uh, and not to admit organizations which have largely differing interests uh, on the theory that we ought to be, not to try to be uh, pretty homogeneous so that we wouldn't be pulled in different directions by, by different special concerns. And I think it's, uh, it's handled that wisely and uh, it's in good shape, both from a program standpoint and uh, a financial standpoint. It, it, it keeps on growing all the time. I think, uh, I think it's interesting that uh, I can't tell you which Japanese automobile organization it is, but it, it, they have a giving program and they have become a member <laughs> of SCAP. And, I think it's Honda, yeah. I have talked to it. One of the difficulties that agencies have on the outside of that organization, you know, this combination of foundations, is that they feel that if they make an application to one foundation, that through that organization, everybody's going to know what their application was. Is that what happened? No, I've never heard of that happening. I, I've never heard uh, that kind of talk, and uh, it, that doesn't mean it doesn't go on. It, it may well. One of the problems of, uh, of an organization such as GAP, and as, as I'm sure you know, there, it's paralleled by regional organizations throughout the country, uh, is um, the question of how far it gets into what might be called cooperative funding. Okay. It's related. It's mm -hmm. not the same question you're asking. It is related, and SCAP has always been uh, uh, reluctant to steer a, uh, an applicant for funds one foundation or another, or to indulge in an activity of, uh, of um, helping donor organizations, its members, uh, join together uh, to support a particular type of <coughs> grantee activity. Uh, I see that changing just a little bit now, but um, it's been SCAP's uh, position that uh, it wants to stay entirely out of the grant-making activities of its members. Uh, it is concerned with educational programs for its members to help them, in general, be educated so as to do a better job, uh, and other activities related to the, to the health of their of the member organization such as financial mm. financial guidance and you know, investment matters and it's not that they provide it but they provide programs that, that uh, make information of that kind available to the members uh, there's a little bit of there's there there is a there's been a uh, a mild insistence among it members members that SCAP should be should make itself available to put to help put together uh, a little coalition of to put it this way a little oh. co coalition of grantors in a field in which SCAP knows they may be interested when something appears to SCAP 
a particular project appears to SCAP to be useful. And I, uh, I, I think they've always been available for, if the Haynes Foundation, which it, it, let me use it as an example because it doesn't involve, involve it doesn't indulge in cooperative funding, but if it did, and if it got a project which was twice as big as it thought it could handle, it could go to the to SCAP and say, what other, fine, here, here's a project we think is worthwhile, we can't handle it, we can handle a part of it, a third or half. What other foundation do you think would be interested in participating as a joint funder of this particular project? Uh, that's being set up a little more, uh, on a little, little more regular basis now than, it's always been available, but. Uh, well, I think foundations are, you know, you can't tell what an individual foundation representative will say when he's in a meeting or she's in a meeting, but uh, I think they've been reluctant to uh, to discuss informally, uh, somewhat reluctant to discuss their grants, not really, but I think they've been reluctant to discuss, discuss the details of the applications that they receive. Well, of course, great many of them were, so. great many of them report their grants, of course, and mm -hmm. what, what specifically the uh, the uh, their funding. Yeah, you know, what what they're funding and why uh, they're interested in particular hmm. thing. Mayor, going back to the United Way now, it's gone through a lot of you know variety of changes. Um, what do you see as the most significant change in this? Well, what, certainly one of them was uh, was the uh, managing finally to put together the national causes with the uh, local ones and to get rid of that uh, monstrosity that <laughs> that Lynn was was uh, out, out of a, out of out of his you know his, his very good judgment and his his uh, deep concern for the welfare of the community uh, he created the, uh, I say he, uh, he primarily created the organization, the, the rival organization, <laughs> in order to harness uh, the interest of the unions and, uh, and large groups of workers and of the cor corporate employers of that. And of course, you know, I didn't think till just now, remember the, the uh, word? No. Associated in donors? Age? Age. Yeah. <laughs> Gosh, it's a good thing that I didn't. Yeah. It didn't no, last until today, isn't it? Sure, it was isn't age. That yeah. And uh, I think the, uh, the final overcoming of that uh, was uh, a tremendous significance in the community. Uh, and really bringing back into the combined enterprise the strength of corporations and the lead corporate leadership, which had been, so much of it had been alienated uh, through the fact that they were, quote, rival organizations, close quote. Um, I think that um, uh, one of the other great changes that has occurred, and I would be thoroughly aware of this because you remember Ethel's participation in the residential campaign and leadership in that was the elimination of the residential campaign, which I think had pluses and minuses. Uh, the, I guess it had to be, in fact, eliminated because of the tremendous uh, administrative load and the tremendous number of man hours that were involved. <laughs> uh, but uh, I think it's too bad for the that that the broad participation on the part of a lot of people in the community has been lost because it used to be I think that there were so many of those residential workers that uh, the community chess campaign was was our campaign and now well, it's now community. it's really their campaign mm -hmm. and um, it's it just that the wide uh, participation in it doesn't exist anymore. 
you know, it's, it's run by the business community now, and I think I think that's too bad. Uh, maybe I maybe I have a prejudice. My my mother was one of the founders of the community cast in Los Angeles. Hmm. You know, and she didn't represent anything, anything except the women's clubs and PTAs and <laughs> and that kind of thing. So you know, the the uh, she was the typical residential worker. The, uh, we were talking about this the other day, the women, you know, the work place. Mm -hmm. And every one of those women said that the only way to the part. Mm -hmm. When the uh, women no longer have a place. Mm -hmm. and, and they no longer have a touch. That's right. I think there's a parallel. Businessmen were sure that, that they did it and could do it better than anybody else could. Uh, I don't I wonder how many years it'll be before half these businessmen are women. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> we got the women back in the act again. <laughs> well, I think that, uh, well, the Yes, I think the the style of uh, uh, the style by which a community, American community, gives to charity is going to keep on changing. Um, we are at the uh, at the ultimate, best, finest way of doing it yet, uh, and. Uh, Businessmen will learn uh, and develop. Uh, the leaders will, one kind or another, will develop new styles of, of doing it that will be more effective. Um, what is, when you ask me about changes, let, let me mm -hmm. just say this. I don't. It seems to me that uh, hospitals were part of the community chest to begin with. Mm -hmm. I think one of the important changes is the elimination of the hospitals from the United Way, uh, which I think was, uh, was simply a matter of the of exigency that they didn't want it. That was a, that was a big load for the, for the community chest to carry, and, um, and it was one that they could drop. And, um, as a hospital board member, I've been on the Good Samaritan hospital board for a number of years. Uh, I'm sorry that uh, that uh, hospitals aren't better integrated with the community effort, which is now United Way. Mm -hmm. the hospitals have strong boards, and uh, a great many of them, and uh, participating, participating in the leadership of the of the United Way, and, and I'm sure a lot of them do, a lot of the individuals do, but not as many as the hospital board. Well, and, they, and they're probably their main, their main giving interest then, too, is that particular mm -hmm. institution. Mm -hmm. uh, it's still, too, that the biggest support for philanthropy comes to the individual. Yeah. Uh, and I, I guess I suppose that one can say, well, that's, that's not very significant. And by the same argument, you say it would be very nice if all the churches belong to the United Way and all the oh, contributions sure. to the sure. churches were made through the United <laughs> Way. <laughs> well, I think that, uh, as we say, although the fashions change, I think that uh, one of the great, great, huge changes, and I don't see any way to get get back uh, is the, the gradual shrinkage 
appreciation, that percentage that our welfare organizations get from the United Way. Mm -hmm. you know, the smaller and smaller percentage of the budget that comes from that source. And uh, that, of course, parallels the inability of the United Way to uh, be able to enforce a, uh, a ban on giving uh, mm -hmm. to non- Except they're trying. To, to, the, to uh, accept to, you know, a ban on giving it outside of the United Way campaign to member organizations. Well, the, the policy of uh, you know, agencies can only go to those corporations that are not immune. Yeah, but those, those rules, although... Uh, I can certainly understand why they're adopted. I don't think they've, you know, there's something like pro prohibition was. And yeah, it's silly. You have, you have the law, but uh, most people don't follow it. Uh -huh. And uh, the United Way is really not in a position to enforce it. Well, and then there are thousands of non-United Way agencies that go to those corporations anyway. Yeah. yeah. So that's, that's a real problem. Uh, they, it's, it's almost to the point at which uh, it could be argued that the best thing to do is to close the door and start all over again. <laughs> you know, close the door, let, let uh, chaos prevail, and then finally after 10 or 15 or 20 years, why, once again there'll be a, a demand for a united way. <laughs> that everybody will be joining in. Yeah, I, I think you have a very good point there. I don't know how that particular problem is going to evolve or not evolve, but uh, it's a mean one. Maynard, in your view, what measures could a volunteer or civic leader undertake to affect programs? And uh, undertake to what? Affect programs and policies. Um, I don't know, of course, you'd, uh, Oh, I know, for it, it, instance, that you were very involved with the Hollywood track thing and, and the United Way. No. Did, as a civilian, did you affect policy one way or the other? At Hollywood? On the Hollywood well, board? Or, no, the Hollywood track. Yeah, I know. Uh, Racetrack. Um, I, you have to be a little more specific in your question. Well, it the, was that, you know, the... Who, who affected what? Well, the, uh, the, uh, the racetracks gave money yeah. to... Well, through a charity board. Yeah. And a percentage of it went to United Way every year. And then they changed the whole thing. Oh. And I know you were involved in this. Yeah, well, um, that was an interesting little piece of history, and uh, while we at the, at the Hollywood Park Charity Board were going through our problems, uh, uh, the, our parallel board at Santa Anita, uh, so far as I know, had, didn't have any problems at all. and. Uh, and everything has worked out very smoothly there. Uh, what, what happened at the Hollywood, in the case of Hollywood, was that uh, the members of our board of trustees were rather heavily oriented to, to United Way. They included Ernie Lobicki and Harry Bard uh, and uh, two or three others, and I, who had been active in you know, anyway, leadership, and we had a uh, we had a rather strong feeling that uh, you know a belief in the United Way process, the stewardship uh, process, and uh, we we were reluctant to involve ourselves in picking our favorite charities, as it were, board members picking their charities they were interested in, although. 
uh, when I went on the board, uh, there was, custom had been established of uh, recognizing Jewish charities. Mm. Uh, and um, uh, gifts were made to Jewish charities other than through United Way. Mm. Uh, and the same was true of some of the Catholic charities. We had a, uh, a Jewish leader on the board, and we had a Catholic leader <laughs> on the board. And uh, those things were done, and uh, uh, and, and a, a few, two or three rather small ones were, uh, became beneficiaries through personal relationships mm. and so forth. But the bulk of it went to United <laughs> Way. Uh, and uh, uh, the... Uh, the ideal arrangement with respect to the legislative arrangement that had been set up on an idealistic basis was that uh, a percentage of the take of the track had to be given to the charity board and the charity board was to be left alone by management mm -hmm. in the determination of where that would go because it, obviously when they this whole thing was a trade-off, you remember, when they started, when they legalized horse racing in California, that uh, it, it's something that was an exact parallel was the lottery money going to the schools. You know, it was, it was a trade-off, and uh, uh, but uh, the legislation uh, tried to put a barrier between the management of the of the racing operation and the disposition of the charitable funds and the, the barrier was right there. The track handed the, handed the money over to the charity board and the charity board saw its own way from there. And uh, uh, what happened at the uh, Hollywood Park was that perhaps we were unwise as a board, as a charity board, in giving so much to United Way, uh, and uh, for being uh, resistant, really, to the wishes of management, which were very understandable, uh, but, but we resisted those wishes, that we made substantial contributions to the Horsemen's Benevolent Protective Association, or whatever it was anyway. There was a charitable, was and is a charitable organization that that works with the uh, employees mm -hmm. of the track and and of the, of the horse owners. And uh, you can argue all the way up and down one way or another, which makes no difference. Uh, but uh, the management of Hollywood Park uh, became unhappy with a very small amount that we were willing to give to that organization as against a very large amount that we were giving to to what uh, uh, some in the management there regarded as a wasteful, uh, somewhat irresponsible operation of the United Way. Hmm. And uh, so the... the uh, procedure that was adopted uh, by management was to establish a second charity board and divide uh, the charity funds between our recalcitrant organization <laughs> and uh, the new one, the new one that had been formed. And uh, we concluded after a while that that didn't make any sense and uh, management was still unhappy with what we were doing. And, so we decided just to get out of the way and close up and turn over what we had left to the other charity board. Mm. <clears throat> it was uh, not entirely pleasant while it was going on, but I think it's I think United Way isn't better off now than it was before, but I think the charitable community is better off for us being out of the way and for that money. Going smoothly into uh, what for the kind charity. Of people are on that board now? Well, there's some very good people on it, uh, including uh, uh, Harry Bart hmm. and uh, somebody else from our board, uh, 
can't think of the minute it was, who it is. But, uh, oh, sure, it was, um, uh, I hate to say, I hate to put this on the record, <laughs> but I can't, yeah, I've turned off a second back. Uh, the name I was trying to think of, of course, is Neil Petrie. He's on the, uh, I think he still is, he became a member of that board, and I think he's still on it. And there, there are good people on that board. Seems to be going on right now, as far as I know. Uh, we're well. There's, there's, there isn't really anything more that can be said about that. Um, ask well, me another question essence, or follow up. In essence, whatever. as a volunteer, though, on a, as a member of that board, um, well, you you. Uh, decided to disband, but that was a policy decision. Yeah, well, and we made a change in the whole atmosphere of that particular thing. We really felt that, um, oh, I say, strike the lead. I felt <laughs> personally that the prerogatives of the trustees of that board were being uh, cramped in a way that the law did not contemplate. Uh, I didn't think everything was bad about making contributions to the to the HPBA, but um, it didn't strike me that they ought to be a any larger beneficiary than than, they, than we were making them. Uh, and uh, management was unhappy about our position, and certainly the activities of management were providing all the funds that we got. So from where they sat, uh, it looked one way, from where I sat, it looked another way. Uh, we could have uh, persisted in continuing the fight, but it was, uh, little things happened that made it more difficult for us to operate, and it just reached a point where we felt that uh, there yeah, well, we felt that the community wasn't being served by our, quote, stubbornness, close quote. <laughs> Maynard, do you have any uh, um, personal papers, pamphlets, biographies of yourself, uh, pictures that we could uh, have to any copy of file on you? Well, I, I, I haven't saved things like that. As a matter of fact, there an example, there are uh, all those boxes which are personal files of mine accumulated over the years. The firm made a little complaint about all the shelf space that those were taking up, and I I thought it was probably thoroughly justified, so I said, well, send them up and uh, I'll go through them. Well, I went through... Uh, I went through... Uh, Like these, yes, that big, and decided that out of those I should save maybe this much. Oh, that's <laughs> that is pretty good. You know, um, I accumulated all the correspondence and uh, everything that went on, and now when I go back uh, several years and look at it, why it's of no significance to anybody uh, now. Uh, and I just haven't been a saver except by throwing things in the thing like that, so you send them to the file room. Uh, and I really don't have any uh, anything of that kind. Do you have, Andy, well, you must have a bio on yourself, don't you? Yeah. You want that? Yeah, sure, okay. I'd like to have that. Do you have any recent picture of yourself? No. In fact, the Haynes Foundation, uh, said, now that I'm a past president, I should be hung on the wall. Uh, yeah. I said, I'm sorry, I don't have any photographs. Well, we ought to try to get one of those, too. Well, I, I, can, uh, I have one at home that I guess I can leave. We'd like to have it in our I can file. leave to them in my will and maybe get a copy for them. <laughs> uh, well, can you think of anything else that you'd like to add to this, Maynard? 
because you've got such a multiplicity of, of activities in your past that you'll never cover them all, I'm afraid. Well, um, I've, let me add that um, my experience with the hospital in the Good Samaritan has been a, a very interesting one, and uh, in a way, and I, In a way, it's a good uh, represents a good study, a good example of uh, what happens in volunteer organizations. Uh, I try to, I'll put it briefly uh, as I can. When I went on the board, uh, John Wilson, uh, John Wilson, the orthopedic surgeon, was. Uh, the leader at the hospital. The father, not the son. Yes. Well, uh, there's another son now. <laughs> uh, no, uh, the uh, the fellow of my generation, the John Wilson of my generation, is the man I'm talking about. Because although I knew his father, I don't don't think his father was ever the leader of the hospital that uh, no, that John but became. His father was a very prominent. Yeah, and a very fine man, maybe a fine man. Uh, at the time I went on the board, uh, it was after, perhaps after the death of the father, at least. But, uh, he, he wasn't active, and the son was very active. And, the, and not too long after that, uh, the leadership, the official leadership, was given to John. Uh, he became president, and uh, Bill Cessnon, who was not terribly active, and not terribly well, uh, he was chairman of the board. And John simply filled a vacuum and did the, uh, that's not the way, right way of putting it, but, it, but he really took the, the leadership of the organization and he was also very active on the faculty at, at USC and he was very active nationally in his profession. Uh, outstanding man and he, he was very, active in raising funds for the hospital from he attracted leading and wealthy patients and his, through his patient group he developed a great ability to produce funds and uh, the board began leaving things to John you know he was really a take charge kind of a man and uh, he didn't he could bring about a a vote on the board without having to explain very much the reasons for it. Uh, and of course he was, he led the whole movement to build a new hospital building. Mm. And while all this was going on, the, Lord, the board became less and less and less active and uh, assuming less and less responsibility and leaving it to John. Uh, and really that continued up until John's rather sudden death. Mm. And we lost, in that one year, we lost not only John, but we also lost Fritz Larkin, who was the chairman of the board. Uh, suddenly we were without leadership and with a board that was not used <laughs> to uh, doing what a board ought to be doing. And uh, we were very lucky in that uh, Fritz Larkin had recruited as his potential successor, successor Mo Benson, who, who was retiring from ARCO. And Mo, Mo agreed to uh, uh, assume the chairmanship a year before he had expected to assume it, and a chairmanship with no president. And so he became president also, mm, didn't realize uh, that. and um, it was uh, very difficult for him to take that all on right, when he did, particularly because it was, it was a very, very critical time that the health care was changing rapidly, and Good Samaritan was not changing, except to lose its leadership and find itself on the board that wasn't used to assuming these responsibilities. 
Uh, and uh, Mo, uh, his first response, first thing we undertook was try to figure out what the top organization of the hospital should be, and he went to his friend Russell Smith, uh, who was chairman of the board of at the Children's Hospital, mm. and changed the direction, which uh, re that resulted in a change of direction from what Fritz had anticipated, and and led to a, uh, a search for a uh, president of the hospital, which was brought, who, a man who was brought from Pittsburgh. And I was chairman of the nominating committee, and and we we had uh, the responsibility of finding new blood for the board uh, and getting the right kind of people on there who would um, would help bring new life to the board. And with the combination of the change in leadership, so which leadership, which was throwing responsibility on the board from that direction and bring new people in who are interested in a, in a board position where they can really <coughs> devote themselves and do something about it uh, has uh, just brought about a com complete change in a two-year period uh, and of course we're we have a moving target because the, the health care field is changing so rapidly it's hard to keep up with but but it's a, it's a prime example of uh, an organization changing from one style of operation to another style of operation to the other style of operation uh, in a very short period of time. And uh, finding board members who are anxious to do, existing board members who are anxious to take leadership, and some who weren't, and that sorted itself out, mm. and uh, and then finding new board members who were willing to really what put their shoulders What kind of orientation did you give the new board members? What kind of organization? Orientation. Oh, uh, the, uh, not very much formal orientation, actually. Uh, such as it is, it's has been simply on an individual basis. The, the, uh, the group orientation of new board members is an art that I have not seen well done. Uh, in my experience, I, I'm sure it is well done in some places. What had happened at the Good Samaritan is that there was very little turnover of the board, so there were very few new board members. Oh, okay. And when, when we began uh, bringing new members on, that was done by a careful interview process ahead of time and, uh, and uh, a clear understanding that the new board member was, was to uh, work and give. Um, we weren't sure enough and aren't sure enough now as to exactly what, the, what directions we're going to be taking to, to uh, give a very good orientation course. Did the board members come on as a group or did they come on one, one by one? And we we are we now, now we went for years and years and years with one year terms and everybody being reelected every year. And mm -hmm. now for the first time we are divided into three okay. classes with three year terms. Uh, but we keep on uh, bringing additional board members on, uh, and I think without exception, they, all of our new board members have, have brought skills to the board and enthusiasm to the board that uh, have been extremely useful to us. And uh, we're in a period of great excitement because uh, things are changing so rapidly. New, new developments and uh, borrowing more money and <laughs> A lot of things oh, yeah. that involve responsibility, and the result is that uh, the board finds it a very exciting enterprise. And uh, I contrast that with uh, other boards I've served on, in which uh, the board becomes uh, more and more apathetic as time goes on, because uh, mm -hmm. 
it doesn't have any healing of responsibility, uh, nor uh, uh, it doesn't feel the uh, that the vitality of the organization is dependent on, on, on board. those board members. They don't have a mission on the board. Yeah. Or they don't know what it is. Yeah. <laughs> have they hired a new executive yet, or a new Oh yes. Yes. Uh, did they change the? Uh, I mean, was there a drastic change in in that job description of that person as contrast to the one before? Uh, no. Uh, well, I, I, I guess yes, yes, and no. Uh, our executive has been Geneva Clamor. And uh, her responsibility as an executive, executive was to administer the hospital. Uh, when uh, when Mo Benson be uh, took over, he went and talked to Geneva and said, "Now I understand the plan is that you are to become president of the organization. And that's the plan that had been discussed with Fritz." And Geneva said, well, there, I wasn't there, but I'm, I'm sure this is, and I've, I've heard enough about it, know this is essentially what happened. She said, I don't have too many more years to go before retirement. And although Fritz talked to me about becoming president, and it was very flattering, uh, I think that, it, that somebody should become president who has a different vision and a different experience and a different outlook on the healthcare field than I have. She said, I don't think I can bring enough to it. And hmm. Modern, a modern hospital, she said, I love to keep on administering the hospital, but, but there are too many things going on that require some experience and knowledge that I don't think, and energy that I don't think I have. Hmm. So, a wise woman, considering the complexities well, of the hospital program. I knew, I knew before she was a wise woman, and she is, and so she is the executive director, that is her title. And we employed a president and gave him a new office uh, you know, a couple of hundred feet away from her office, uh, where the, the enlarged concerns of the hospital are run out of that office, and Geneva out of her office manages, administers the hospital care as such. Mm. And uh, uh, that was a very, very oh, wise I, move. It, they, yeah. they had done the same thing. You know, something you want to touch on before that. Well, I think that's all I have to say. No, I don't think so. The. Uh, uh, We recently, Francis, had a um, uh, so-called retreat in which we took a late afternoon and an evening <clears throat> talking about our mission and uh, with the help of Alan Kumamoto uh, talking about mission and program and things of that kind. The first is what might be several meetings. And uh, I was disappointed in the attendance that we had at that meeting. Uh, that process will have to be continued. It's, um, in my view, the um, uh, the board of the volunteer center is has not been and is not now performing as the board should. And I don't think there'd be any disagreement on that statement from any board members. Really, and uh, I think the volunteer center has to, the board has to pull itself up by its bootstraps there and uh, make some decisions as to what it thinks the mission of the volunteer center is, and then decide whether that mission is one that is deserving of, of their time and interest and energy. And based on that decision, either have the individuals either uh, 
say, well, this, what's in prospect here is something that really doesn't interest me and I ought to get off the board, uh, or say, well, this does interest me, this is worth my time and attention, I'm willing to stay on the board and put my shoulder to the wheel. Uh, I think that process has to be, which is, we kind of started in the meeting to which I refer, but as I say again, I'm terribly disappointed in the small turnout. Uh, I think that has to be uh, developed and continued uh, to a point where there is a mutual concurrence in, in what the Volunteer Center is all about. How much does the executive put into getting the board members interested in this? Um, well, I think the uh, <coughs> I think the total I think the executive John Kern and uh, the people that work with him uh, are uh, are concerned on that issue. I don't know that they know exactly how to get from here to there. Uh, it's, it's something that I think uh, staff leadership and board leadership have to build together. Uh, and uh, uh, I don't think there's any, I mean, I think the, the staff leadership would like very much to have the kind of an organization that I'm, that I'm saying that we ought to have there, but um, I'm not sure that anybody knows how to get from here to there. I mean, you're doing that some of these boards and that started during the 60s. Well, the United Way started doing it, you know, where the board met every three months. Yeah. Um, do you think that leads to less communication or less participation? Yes, I think so. Um, maybe it's justified or maybe it isn't by the circumstances, but um, and you can look at, you, you, there's a certain parallelism uh, with, with the business corporation boards, mm -hmm. I think. Uh, I've had experience of both ways. Uh, you can have, a, I've been on uh, corporate boards where the meetings the board meetings were uh, occurred quarterly uh, and were pretty much pro forma because uh, a big business was being carried on by the staff under very capable leadership at the top uh, and um, uh, there were not a lot of novel questions arising you know not no huge expansion going on, a decision to expand gradually perhaps, something of that sort. Uh, and I'm on another, I am now on another corporate board which meets monthly and everybody comes, every meeting, not only meets monthly but the outside directors meet almost monthly as a either an audit committee or a compensation committee or some other kind of a committee so that a meeting, uh, the combination of the two meetings uh, would take uh, you know, eight or ten hours a month. Uh, and they're perfectly attended. Almost never is an outside director or an inside director absent. Uh, but the company is a is a very is one in a field and uh, an activity which is quite vital and which is threatened on the one hand and which has a lot of opportunities on the other hand uh, and the board members are uh, very aware of their li potential liabilities and they, uh, 
they aren't frightened by that. They're just uh, driven to uh, performing awfully well. Uh, so that can happen. There's those differences in in uh, regular business corporation board also. And while um, while the uh, volunteer center board was being quite passive and, uh, uh, and and relatively inactive and uninvolved, relatively uninvolved, uh, I was, saw that board operate, and at the same time I was watching the, what happened at the Good Samaritan Hospital when a relatively uninvolved board <laughs> became terribly involved in a, mm -hmm. in a very short period of time uh, due to some of the circumstances that that I've been talking about. Uh, so it is a whether a board improves in its uh, in its productivity and in its assumption of responsibility or deteriorates in those respects uh, can be due to a lot of different causes. Oh, yes. And uh, when when something is when an organization is just kind of rocking along, as the Good Samaritan Hospital was under John Wilson, it might have rocked along <laughs> into into serious trouble. But while rocking along like that, why the board the board will be be less and less active and feel less and less responsibility and and be willing to leave it more and more to John. You see. Uh, uh, and that's not the way uh, that type of organization was planned. The board is planned to have a certain responsibility, and the administration is planned to have a certain responsibility. When that balance isn't properly preserved, the organization is in some jeopardy. Well, that's what I, <clears throat> I thought the Knoxville was really a very healthy kind of phenomenon in that it re-emphasized the, mm -hmm. the uh, responsibility of the board. Well, <clears throat> those, um, there's, a, there's a limit that, of course, that, uh, that laws can, can reach. Uh, and uh, the difference between a good operation and from the standpoint we've been talking about is the of the proper role playing uh, and a, a mediocre organization is, I think, is not really going to be due to legislation that is passed, but, oh, no. but to, the, uh, to the to the other circumstances that are involved, including the including the circumstances, the whole the whole ambience, the environment, the business environment. The, operational environment that surrounds the organization and the understanding and uh, uh, of uh, the parties of the roles they should play and the uh, and the insistence of the parties on the roles that, that they should play on their uh, assistance on the role the other can play should play is uh, is more important than insistence on the role that you play yourself and uh, I saw this, I've already indicated, I saw this same thing at SCAP. Uh, when people were willing to leave it to Joe, Joe Dempsey in that case, uh, the board was weak. And uh, the organization did not move forward strongly and did not carry out the potential program and didn't fill the niche that it was that was there for it to fill. It, it, it got into it a little bit, and as I say, Joe is entitled to credit for having started it, but it wasn't until uh, a different philosophy prevailed as to the responsibility of the executive and the responsibility of the board vis-a-vis -vis the organization as a whole that, that that organization began to prosper, began to develop it a strong program that began to develop a great growth in membership, developed a sensible dues structure, uh, and all those 
were due to, in part, to uh, the leadership provided by the executive. Who is a trained professional. Right. Uh, and in part by uh, uh, by the board leadership, which uh, seized the opportunity that, or, or accepted the challenge, whichever way you want to look at it, to move from uh, uh, relative ineffectiveness to a uh, point where the board is fairly effective there, quite reasonably effective. I think one of the most common diseases in these agencies is the understanding of the board role and the understanding of the executive role. It causes me problems on consulting all the time. Yeah. Well, uh, it perhaps depends, depends more on the executive than it seems to me, in my experience, than anyone else to start with. Because uh, a good executive, you know, an able person, can uh, gradually absorb all of the responsibility and all the authority. And also knows how to make use of the talent of the board members. Right. Uh, well, I'm, ass I'm assuming that the, uh, I'm assuming a, an outlook on the part of, a, of an individual that he can do it better than anybody else can. And if he has that attitude, why uh, he or she can, uh, over a fairly short period, accomplish that result. So that, uh, on the other hand, a really uh, good and experienced chief executive uh, knows that one of the most difficult parts of his job is to activate the board and to uh, activate the board, not only as a board, but also in, a, in its committee operations, uh, and pass, keep passing and keep mm -hmm. keep laying on the table in front of the board members, either as a board or as committee members, decisions that, that he knows they ought to be making, and providing all the guidance that he can with respect to those decisions, but insisting that that those decisions be made by the board members and occasionally having the board members take a go a direction otherwise other than the direction that he would like to have it take. Uh, but uh, you know, assuming a reasonable degree of wisdom on the parts of both the uh, executive and the board, why the organization's going to be stronger as a result of that, even if it does make a mistake once in a while. Well, and I think that's the, if I, looking at United Way in the last few years, the, uh, I think United Way forgot it was non-profit. Mm -hmm. In other words, it slipped over into the philosophy of the, of the corporate profit-making kind of thing too far. And I think a lot of the agencies are tend to think that way too. Well, it's, um, I don't know if you're referring to the loans made to the, uh, mm -hmm. the new executives. Uh, that's, a that's a difficult problem because uh, styles in the corporate world tend to become uh, forced on the, on the nonprofits also in many mm -hmm. cases. And um, now our recruitment of personnel is a, on a nationwide basis, and there are some styles that have been set up by rec with the help of recruiters and other organizations that present difficulties. Uh, I, I saw one instance of a, of a nonprofit organization uh, in which um, that problem was met by, by one of the board members saying, uh, well, I control a uh, a foundation, and uh, I will see that you get a loan from that foundation, interest <laughs> interest free, of the amount of money is necessary to move you. Mm. You know, well, there you go. and you know it's a perfectly legitimate thing for the for the foundation to do, but that took it out of the realm of of uh, using the organization's own funds. Mm -hmm for that purpose and, uh, and uh, prevented the, 
the unfortunate result in, in the United Way case, uh, the, uh, the public outcry, the media outcry mm -hmm. about donated funds being used for these for these loan purposes to help private individuals. Uh, uh, by the way, I think that outcry was thoroughly unjustified, and uh, that particular angle to it, because whatever United Way does is with donated funds. Yeah. <laughs> and the, the fact that they were donated funds uh, didn't make it evil of itself. Maybe they, perhaps the loans were not wise, but uh, the fact that they were made out of donated funds to me was absolutely irrelevant against that outcry that mm -hmm. came from the media on the subject and colored the, certainly colored the uh, public attitude toward what went on there. Well, the constant, uh, well, like this new issue now that's uh, for Congress, I think, on the, uh, you know, what is when the nonprofits go into mm -hmm. some businesses, what is fair and what is unfair. I have a, uh, I happen to have a few biases on that, <laughs> having been a victim of it. <laughs> of uh, some of the uh, judicial decisions along those particular lines. But it is, it certainly is true that when a, uh, when a nonprofit uh, uh, finds itself in competition with profit-making organizations for the same customers, that uh, everybody better look out. The example I'm referring to is and I wasn't personally involved in it, but I referred to the uh, earlier when we've been talking to the American Bar Foundation, which is mm. a research organization dependent entirely on, on other sources for its funds. And one of those sources was another affiliate of the American Bar Association that, that for very good purposes, raised money by a life insurance program in which, uh, in which the lawyers who participated in that life insurance program permitted the premiums that they would otherwise have received to go to the to the charitable to the lawyer charity organization, and some of that money got to the American Bar Foundation. Well, it, uh, of course, what happened is that uh, eventually the Life insurance companies said we're being we're being taken here because people are buying life insurance uh, and from somebody else rather than from us uh, and uh, are getting the benefit of a charitable deduction by making giving their premiums to the to that particular charity and uh, so that operation has a, has an unfair advantage over us. We're in competition, and they get it without taxes, and we have to pay taxes. And whenever that situation exists, I, sooner or later, they, if it's of any size, why well, sooner or later, the, those that are paying taxes uh, have, a, have a beef. Mm -hmm. And uh, that source gets turned off by the courts. Uh, well, there's a... Uh there's a lot of that, you know, very on the edge. Yes. Between those two in yes. an operation all the time. Yes, of course there is. And uh, there's um, there's more to be done in with both legislation and judicial decisions in that whole field. We aren't we aren't yet to the place where we should be. I hate to say that because. Uh, <coughs> We're so burdened with tax legislation now. <laughs> <laughs> Don't need any more. <laughs> well, Maynard, I think unless we Francis kept Cliff, Maynard for two hours. Yeah, I think that's pretty good. <laughs> and I think we have some very useful information. Do you have some last words you want to uh, pass on to us about no, the role of a volunteer in social welfare? 
I don't think there are going to be any last words. Uh, as I said, I think that the role keeps changing. And uh, uh, flexibility and willingness to adapt to change, I think, are the well, that's good are because keynotes. It, it means that church is well dynamic field. Uh, and the role is. of the volunteer yeah. is dynamic. Well, I think that social welfare organizations that uh, that don't adapt are in, you know, they're, they're headed for trouble just the way a business organization that doesn't adapt is. They may not, may not wind up in Chapter 10, but they, <laughs> well, they may gradually go out of business. <laughs> I think that's true. And I think the, um, uh, concurrently too, is some of them can't adapt to um, what I call the unwritten laws <laughs> in the field of social welfare, which is, uh, well, which is pretty necessary. I, I wish some of those things were written down somewhere. You know, where the, you don't give, uh, one of the things that I got called about from the volunteer center after I left was, um, we want to make a donation to another agency. And I said, you can't do that. <laughs> Money given to you was for a certain purpose. You can't give it to something. <laughs> well, I, I suppose that the last word that I would uh, <laughs> emphasize would be just what we're saying that that uh, the ability to adapt to change is, is more and more of a premium on that in today's world. And it's uh, obvious to me that while, while whereas <clears throat> of course some underlying principles remain true, but uh, the way things are done and uh, and what kind of things will work and what kind of mm. things won't work have, have keep on changing with increasing rapidity and it puts a tremendous premium on executives and board members who who have foresight and uh, that's a quality that isn't easily come by you can uh, go ahead with the best will in the world and, and find yourself in serious trouble because uh, you, you, you haven't recognized the changes that are taking place and are going to take place in the evolution uh, in the environment in which you're working and uh, I, I, I have always felt that that rate of change is becoming faster and faster I don't know what, what we can keep up with it and I don't think that that feeling is simply the result of, of aging no, I, I think you just look around at our whole system scene and you see many illustrations. Yeah. I don't think it's aging. The pace really has speeded up. It just keeps on speeding up, doesn't it? Yeah. So uh, uh, it, it puts a higher and higher premium on foresight yeah. in any activity that, that we engage in, either as individuals or in groups. And that's the volunteer's role to bring some foresight yeah. and rational behavior. Well, I think that the, the, the executive has that same responsibility. Uh, they'll, they'll look at, uh, if it works right, that's quite natural that, that the volunteer and the executive will, will uh, approach the problem from their own somewhat different standpoints and the combination of what they can both come up with is, is going to be very important. That's a good point to close mm -hmm. on. I think so.
<laughs> and I think we have some very useful information. Do you have some last words you want to uh, pass on to us? No, uh, the role of a volunteer in social welfare? I don't think there are going to be any last words. Uh, as I said, I think that the role keeps changing. Keeps changing. And uh, uh, flexibility <laughs> and willingness to adapt to change, I think, are the well, that's good because it, it means that social welfare is a dynamic field. Well, and the role is. of the volunteer yeah. is dynamic. Well, I think that social welfare organizations that, um, that don't adapt are you know, they're, they're headed for trouble just the way a business organization that doesn't adapt is. They may not, may not wind up in Chapter 10, but they... <laughs> Well, they may gradually go out of business. <laughs> I think that's true. And I think the, um, uh, concurrently too, if some of them can't adapt to um, what I call the unwritten laws <laughs> in the field of social welfare, which is, uh, well, which is pretty necessary. I wish some of those things were written down somewhere. You know, where the, you don't give, uh, one of the things that I got called about from the volunteer center after I left was, um, we want to make a donation to another agency. And I said, you can't do that. <laughs> Money given to you was for a certain purpose. You can't give it to something. Well, I, I suppose that the last word that I would uh, emphasize would be just what we're saying, that, that uh, the ability to adapt to change is, is more and more of a premium on that in today's world. And it's uh, obvious to me that while, while, whereas, <coughs> of course, some underlying principles remain true, but uh, the way things are done and, uh, and, and what kind of things will work and what kind mm. of things won't work have, have keep on changing with increasing rapidity. And it puts a tremendous premium on executives and board members who, who have foresight. And uh, that's a quality that isn't easily come by. You can uh, go ahead with the best will in the world and, and find yourself in serious trouble because uh, you, you haven't recognized the changes that are taking place and are going to take place in the evolution uh, in the environment in which you're working. And uh, I, I, I have always felt that that rate of change is becoming faster and faster. I don't know what what so we can keep up with it. And I don't think that that feeling is simply the result of uh, aging. No, no. I, I think you just look around at our whole social scene and you see many illustrations. Yeah. I don't think it's aging. The pace really has speeded up. It it keeps on speeding up, doesn't it? Yeah. So uh, uh, it, it puts a higher and higher premium on foresight in any activity that that we engage in, either as individuals or in groups. And that's the uh, volunteer's role to bring some foresight. Yeah. And rational behavior. Well, I think that the, the, the executive has that same responsibility. Uh, they'll, they'll look at, uh, if it works right, that's quite natural that the, that the volunteer end is Executive will will uh, approach the problem from their own somewhat different standpoints, and the combination of what they can both come up with is, is going to be very important. That's a good point to close mm -hmm. on. I think so.
me. This is Ethel Toll, who has served in this community rather actively since 1935. But before that, I went to Occidental College, where I was a major in economics and a minor in sociology, which first opened up the field of community and organization and needs. And I can remember during that period of only about two field trips, but they impressed me a great deal. One was the old general hospital, and we had a big tour. And one was the juvenile hall, and I think there were others, but those two were the ones that impressed me. Then I was married and did not do much until I was invited to join the Junior League in 1935. And their provisional course, which is about eight weeks or more, is very well done and thoroughly done, particularly in those days, using the best of Of course, Children's Hospital and many, many others. And I was so excited of all the needs that came into this community. Unfortunately for me, at the beginning, when I finished the course and was ready to be pounced on for placement by friends in those days before they had professional placement director, um, a friend was head of what was then known as the Civics Committee in, junior, in the Junior League. And one of their problems then was the uh, biennial versus the permanent system of registration. And we went out to different counties, Riverside and San Bernardino, I remember. It was the last thing I thought of doing, wanting to do, because I had this whole new view of the community after the course. But as it turned out, and I look back, uh, I think maybe it was providential in that I uh, uh, was a member. We worked with the League of Women Voters, and they were very active. This now was the period of the migratory workers, and I soon, I think within the first year, was on the board of directors. They were not well um, supplied with people in those days, and I was child welfare chairman, so I was closely involved with the migratory camps, which were really abominable in those days. Uh, because I, well, I would say 30, about 36 to 38, and, the and depression the depression years, and the migratory workers came in that period. The camps were just uh, unbelievable, and here were many, many children that had come from the Dust Bowl. And Helen Gahagan, the famous actress, and later in Congress, um, We'd go out to the, I was the mother of a few little ones and couldn't get away on weekends. And Helen Hagen would go out and visit the migratory camps on the weekends and then report to me on Monday of what she had seen. So I was very concerned about the situation, particularly their not being accepted into schools because none of the community wanted these uh, infested children in. And they, they wouldn't have them in their school for fear the other children would get diseases. Well, after great efforts, we did get a mobile school that moved with the crops so that a teacher we could have. But all that comes later, but I was instrumental in helping to get that started. It was also through this activity at the League of Women Voters, and I was only on that board about two years because then I went off into social agencies that had interested me. Um, Carl Holpen, who was then chief of probation in Los Angeles County, called me one day to ask me if I'd come to the, down and uh, to the jail to have lunch with him and see the conditions at the jail. This being the Depression years, there were many, many runaways. And um, so that what he was concerned with is that the juvenile 
commission, juvenile hall commission, had a flat rule that they would never take anyone after 16. And there was that group between 16 and 18, they had to throw right into the jail. And um, which he thought was very, very bad. He said most of them were never done anything criminal, but to run away from home. There was a lot of running away from home during those bad years. So he took me, and in a cell that was made for four, it would be eight, and they, 16 and 18 year olds would be sleeping on the floor with four adult people, and they were mistreated, and they were in a bad way. And then I was to try to sell the community to get pressure for the juvenile hall to change their ruling, even for a temporary time, to take in this group, which was a large group, 16 to 18, because they came from all over the country, and the main thing was to get them sent back home, if you could, instead of having them learning very bad things under very bad conditions in our jail. Did they have a welfare department at that time, Ethel? Nope, no welfare department. The juvenile hall had a bed, but this was in our regular county jail where these were yes, thrown. Right. And the juvenile hall had some professional mm -hmm. counseling, but not as extensive as it is now. They didn't have, it's the same story that the juvenile hall has had until this day. Uh, they complain, uh, studies are made and they complain about the same thing, and yet they're never allotted enough money to make it possible for, um, for uh, them to cope with the numbers. It's always overcrowded. It's always been uh, undermanned as far as services and whatnot. So that has been, uh, that has always been a problem. Well, I stayed because I, as I said in that course, I was so interested in the network of social agencies within our system and how they uh, helped in serving. It was my first introduction to it. That, uh, that there again, it was sued by then, a professional uh, who was director of placement for the Junior League had me in for my annual interview, and she said, you know, I note that you have only been doing things with the League of Women Voters, and you should be doing something in some of our social agencies. And I said, that's just what I wanted to do, but I got forced into it before we had a professional to, um, to look at your record and see where you'd be better placed. And she said, well, how would you like to serve on the family service? Then it was called the Family Welfare Association. How would you like to serve on their case committee? And I said, oh, I'd love to serve on their case committee. And through that experience, I, a professional of the staff of the agency would present a case she had, with, needless to say, no names. She would uh, come in and tell about the father who had worked all his life and no job and not wanting to take welfare, but they had six children and they couldn't couldn't get a job and the conditions of how they lived and whatnot. And there was another great big eye opener because I didn't know people lived in quite such a squalor as I learned. Well, I was on that committee a year or so and then made chairman and I served on it for well, I don't know, four years, I guess, and then was on the board of directors. I was president of that agency in 43 to 45 under a terrific exec executive, Mrs. Blythe Francis, who was very well trained and was superb in training the volunteer mm -hmm. worker uh, as to what the meaning of the job was and the importance of certain jobs. I was very impressed with the staff. Um, now Frances Feldman was on the staff. Well, I can't think of her maiden name. I knew it very well. Of course, Norman, she, I think it was. And she left the agency to go with the county. I remember that being the biggest tragedy. And Mrs. Francis saying to me, oh no, she can serve a greater number and make some improvements in their standards because family social, or family service, I was going to say, because that's its present name, always had very high standards of, of casework and did a great deal. And uh, so I enjoyed, 
that was my first agency of ever serving on the board. And I uh, enjoyed it thoroughly and learned a lot. I learned about the planning of that whole field. There were other family service agencies. One was the Jewish. The Assistance League had a small one. And the Catholic had been. There were four. And uh, the family service prided itself on the casework and, and the training of their workers so much. And uh, so that was a great experience. From that, one thing leads to another. In those days, well, I think I was then went on what we call then the Council of Social Agencies. It's the Welfare Planning Council now. And, uh, and there, four, there were four divisions. There was family service, health, recreation, and I, I, I know, just the, a youth services, and youth services. And um, I think I served in every one of those divisions. I was on the board of the Welfare Planning, of the Welfare Planning Council, we'll say now. And then throughout many years of serving, I served agencies that fell into each one of those four categories. One period, I was vice president of the Girl Scouts. I was vice president of the Children's Hospital. I would be the health field and did other things in the health field. I still had family services and my interests there. Recreation, I don't know. I was close to the Recreation and Parks Committee because one thing always leads to another when you get yourself involved in this. And uh, so I had that experience. Then early, I think even before the Junior League training, I had started working for the community chest, and I was a door-to-door -door person. And then uh, gradually went up the ladder to being a major and a colonel and district chairman of those things, and then um, was for four years a chairman for the community chest annual drive of uh, of, of uh, the entire city the, uh, for organizing. And in those days, we had a heavy residential door-to-door -door, uh, thing. So we had 13 districts. And one year, they decided we'd have 26, divide them so that we would have it smaller. But we did go back to the 13. But that stretched from the border of Montebello Beverly Hills, which was a separate city, but then on in down into Sentinella Valley, and it was a huge area. And this was long before the days of freeways, and you'd go out and get those done. But there again, I learned more about our community, going out, meeting, getting first the district chairman, and then with her going to her meetings with when she gets the colonels, and and each of these communities had. Uh, very definite, except for different needs, but some of them very needy. I can remember meeting out in East Los Angeles where there were no sidewalks and, you know, where you thought they should be recipients more than they should be the ones raising the money because most of the women worked and there was not much. But it was meeting once at Cleland House with the colonels and the district chairman, and they were all foreign born. And all of them, I wondered what I was out there organizing, and all of them, when I left, when I was there and thanking them, they said, oh, thank you, Mrs. Toll. We come from a country where you can't volunteer, and this was their great feeling of privilege in this country. And they said that it was a privilege to be able to do this. And I would come home singing instead of having my chin down, just listening to what it is. And there probably is, practically, you should not have residential, of course. I realize this in this size city, because at that time, there were about, if fully organized, you had about 90,000 volunteers under you. And, and they got very meager. The budgets uh, were not large for areas, and there was an awful lot of shoe leather that was used. 
I do think that, though, that that whole thing did a, a public relations job for the city, and I realize now where the quotas are hundred times or more than what they were in those days, that, that you just can't do that. But it takes the heart out of some of those uh, experiences that people had. And then at the end of when the campaign was over, we'd always have a, a meeting with all the volunteers for their suggestions and to see what we could do better in another year and, and evaluate what we had done and so forth. And all of that not only brought that community closer together, but it certainly brought me close to the total community because I was involved in all parts of the cities, and wonderful experiences came out of that. And it's too bad um, in some way something like that couldn't happen today, but it, I guess it wouldn't be very practical as it was in those days. People would be afraid of areas. Uh, because of crime and stuff, but uh, I think we even had some of it then, as I remember. And then we but come... the miracle was there was very little. <laughs> very little was. We were a part of something, and everybody was involved, and, and it was a wonderful experience. Then came the war, and I moved that we had the war chest in place of the community chest, and the war chest took in various agencies um, supporting their agencies that had been operating, but not just the local agencies of the community chest. You'd have the English War Relief, and you'd have the various countries' war relief, and, and uh, I can't think of all their names now. But the war chest was a great experience. I sat on the board. And in those days, as I look back on the on the War Chest Board of Directors. I think I was the only woman. Mrs. Crutcher might have been on that, I'm not sure, but uh, uh, the women weren't very much of it. You, you had a great experience. So during the war years, along with Dick McCune, who was from the Bank of America, and I were co-chairmen of what they called Associated Cities and Towns. So we had to cover from Wilmington and San Pedro uh, oh, way, way up to Malibu, all in the, out in San Fernando Valley, the different ones, um, and, and any of the towns, Santa Monica being a separate town, and Beverly Hills being separate. I guess we took in Hermosa, too. And anyway, and we did have Long Beach and Wellington, and that was an experience. Uh, fortunately, uh, he was had a man with me as my partner and always a staff person, but we held most of those meetings at night. Those were long drives in those days, but I met there again the most <coughs> wonderful elements of cities and of just really great experiences to work with them. So I really saw the community even on a broader scale then. Then along, I guess it was in the 40s, I was on various boards of oh, I mentioned Children's Hospital, and, and I was, oh, I know, I was um, director of public relations, and it's when they were first starting all their guilds, and uh, they only had two in those days. Uh, one was the Hollywood uh, Guild of the Children's Hospital, and one was I think the Kate Crutcher workers. But with that, we went out to Azusa and Glendora and all through the valley and, and uh, organizing various ones that are all very active now. And I'm out of date to tell you how many there are of these guilds, but there are an awful lot of them. But that, too, was a great experience in that you saw even a greater community working around and seeing all of these people. And I found it exceedingly satisfying. The experience at the hospital was also satisfying in that we, it was originally when I went on their board, only women. And I, I was with Mrs. Norman Chandler. We wrote the bylaws, putting in that we could have men, also to have um, uh, specialized terms of three years instead of going on for all the time. And 
<coughs> we got a lot of things done that now as I look at the hospital and see what some of the men board members have done to make it uh, uh, financially sound and and things and see the leadership I'm very proud of looking back and seeing the place I'm also thinking of family service because there's you know, about five years ago they started something called the family service associates and it came from um, out of a group that had been rest haven and here I am sitting on that, this uh, starting with family service and sort of leaving with family service associates. It's just the fundraising arm, but do, do participate actively. I meant to mention the uh, mental health field. I first was on the board at Rest Haven uh, Mental Health Center. It wasn't called the Mental Health Center then. I think it was just called Rest Haven in the beginning, and then we became a, a mental health center and got the first federal grant uh, in the United States, which was a large one, to expand the services. And that was an exciting experience. I was on that board. I was president around 1960, 63, along in there. And uh, Rest Haven, unfortunately, is no longer, and it had been a strong agency. But from that, I became involved in the mental health field. And the mental health field, we then had mental health commission, which was an interesting, it wasn't what I could contribute, but what I could learn, because they had many psychiatrists on it. They had every mental health facility represented, and the state mental health would be down for it, and it was exceedingly informative and helpful. And what I'm trying to point out is that from one thing, if you don't stay in one little alley and get out and see the bigger world, everything is a, a feedback. What you bring to one agency uh, and you learn more, you can do it. And from that, it's, it's transferable information that you can learn about things. So the mental health field became important to me. and and. It also sort of ties in with family service, heaven knows, or with the family division of fam welfare planning, in that it is a family problem if there is mental health problem in it. And um, it was, those were really kind of exciting years, because we had to get involved with the state, and we worked hard to get the, worked hard to get the, um, um, uh, to not lock people up in our big state institutions, but to release them, but to have enough services within a community that they could be taken care of on a home basis or near home. Unfortunately, the law went through that they unlocked an awful lot of people and then didn't have enough funds for the agencies within the community to serve those people. That was the whole idea of this thing. And um, that's why today we see so many people homeless, or those on the street, or the bag women that uh, have any place to go, nor do they want to go any place, really. They really are mental health cases that needed some kind of support during a very important period of their life, and then just it was not available. So these disappointments where you work hard on something to get something done. And that leads me over to my time with crime and delinquency, which <coughs> was uh, one of my last big projects. I was on the national board of the National uh, Crime and Delinquency Board and met in New York. Then I was the state chairman of the California Crime and Delinquency. And that involves you with the professionals with all, I suppose I've visited every, not every, but I've visited certainly all those in the South, whether Youth Authority or our state institutions, some in the North. We met in Sacramento some. And you work so hard to try to see what you can do to, to not lock everybody up. The old saying was, we just can't afford to lock everybody up. Uh, because those on the outside can't possibly afford 
to support those on the inside because his prices went up and up and they were doing it. After all these years and with tremendous leadership on the part of so many professionals and Dick McGee, head of corrections, the youth authority, that we worked so hard to get things done that all seemed right. And now it's gotten worse and worse, and those are the distressing things. Mm -hmm. I was worked very hard for the work release program and uh, going to many probation departments in other counties other than here, which was an idea that a nonviolent person could serve his time in jail or in prison, and then be released by day. He could go back to his old job, say he was a mechanic or whatever he was, and then go back and report to the institution that night. And <coughs> this worked very well in Santa Clara County. It was sort of a model. And we did get it through. Now, in a couple of cases, and this is what gets so discouraging, uh, it was someone on work release from San Quentin that unfortunately held up a gas station, as I remember, or took a car from a gas station, and that was such a, such a hue and cry over that thing. Now they don't have work release. Instead, we have our prisons way too full and waiting for all the riots that are bound to happen uh, very soon. And those are when you've really worked, and you've traveled the state, and you've met with the best in professional leadership, as well as getting top volunteers or people who can speak for, whose word has some influence in the community. And you're working hand in hand with them. They have been just wonderful. So those are the things that get a little bit discouraged in the mental health field and in the crime and delinquency field after thinking we'd made such progress to find it not there at all. In the probation department, I've always had an interest because uh, starting way back from the days I first visited the probation department 40 years before, or 50 now, I guess, um, they never have had enough uh, money in the budget to have the proper supervision. Probation officers have been so overloaded. The ideal, by any, stand, any studies in the whole United States, the ideal is that a probation officer would never have more than 30 to look after after they're released. Uh, now I'm getting away from the probation department, but we'll talk probation in the whole. 30. Most of them have about 200. And the probation officers have said, there's no way. You could call them up maybe once every two weeks to see if they're still alive or haven't skipped the city, but no way can you go by to do the work you've been trained for to see whether they um, are getting along in their job or what they could do. And not any <coughs> possibility of it if you have a caseload of, sometimes it's over 200. And so I've tried to appear before the supervisors for our own county many times to get more money or make something more re realistic for a probation department. Now the, the juvenile hall itself has been so berated unfairly, I think. Uh, why don't they do this and why don't they do that? They don't give enough people there to supervise these youngsters being picked up and coming in late at night or or, uh, or, case work, or case workers to be there to cope with them on a 24-hour basis is just no money to do it. We finally got to have one that would be an intake person, but um, I don't know. I've decided that maybe the public doesn't want to understand. They can complain afterwards, why did they let somebody out, or why didn't they do it? But if they don't want to understand, it's not as easy to raise money to, or to change the minds of those that provide the money in that field as it is into having a beautiful parks, so, which we need too, I don't have to plenty, but to have things that just, there's something about the the delinquent, the hard to raise, the 
uh, that it's hard to get per people to serve on their boards. I mean, people would better serve on not well, not those with the great problems. But the probation department and the juvenile hall just needs the support. Uh, the firing of Mr. Fitzpatrick a few years ago, chief probation officer, was really a trumped up thing because if they wanted to fire him, that's one thing, maybe. He was getting along in years. But on trumped up charges of why didn't they have fewer in the hall, and that isn't his fault. I mean, if other people dumped them in, and they brought up someone from San Diego who was a fine man, Mr. Fitzpatrick did get back in. Well, it was a long, hard battle with the law, and he won. But, and then I suppose retired, but to have that to have served all those years and then to have that mark against you at the end of a, a great career is very sad. The caliber that I have found of men, and women too, but they're mostly men that came in my life there, in our correction department, in our probation department, in our youth authority department, are the most outstanding, intelligent, dedicated men. And it, I just wish more people could meet them because they would see the caliber of person they're working with, which is, I found, higher than some of our teachers or professors and whatnot, because I've been a trustee at Occidental College for 45 years, and I'm getting tired of talking. No, but I, I but yeah, why don't you want to uh, poke it and ask me some questions? Because I, I could wander on forever, and I don't know how to bring it down. Okay, we're going. As I look back over, I guess it's now 50 years of active participation and have been certainly honored by this community with many, many awards and citations from the Human Relations Committee to the Gold Key and many other things. I have to look back to individuals who really guided me to get started and show me the way in many places. Starting way back, as I reported early, Carl Holm, who was then chief of probation Los Angeles County in the 30s, and then was the first director of the Youth Authority, taught me a lot about crime and the problems of youth and crime. And after he retired, he used to come and call on me, and we'd reminisce the old times, but he had a a dedicated, he was intelligent, he was knowledgeable, he was great, and he had a tremendous friend. Arlene Johnson, well, I should say first Blythe Francis, because she came into my life then, who was the executive of Family Service, taught me so many things. Uh, she was very well prepared, educated, and taught me so many principles in social work. And, and we had long hours together because as president of that, we had nine district offices and they had district consults. And not every month, but we would, every other month or so, we would go to each one of those. And they could be in San Fernando Valley Council or it could be in Wilmington, San Pedro, or it could be down in Sentinella Valley, it could be all over. And we had many hours in the car riding together um, uh, because there were no freeways then and it took us quite a, a while to get there and back and forth. She not only was the greatest caseworker for me and my own family problems because <laughs> I could ask her things, I always told her I was the best um, patient her, or, uh, in the whole agency because she did so much, whether it be problems of adolescence, her little children, or the aged, and that. Then came Arlene Johnson, who arrived about this time, and she was terrific. And during the years that I was provisional chairman of the Junior League of Provisional Course, she used to give me such guidance, and always speak, and uh, she was so wise, so patient, and so understanding that I, I do her great honor. I mean, I, she does great honor to even have known her. Then come the people in the probation department, I mean, in the correctional department that were 
so knowledgeable. And in that, I can say Richard McGee up there, and I can see Heman Stark, who was then head of probation here. Um, uh, innumerable people that used to come and help me in all this, and those of the staff of the National Council on Crime and Delinquency, of which I was a member and worked with. They were outstanding, and that would be um, or except Mil Milton Rector was the executive of the National Council, but he would come to California a lot. Then in the mental health field, I learned so much about the principles of mental health from the so from some of the top psychiatrists here who gave so freely of their time. I'm going to come up with his name, <laughs> who was on many boards and was trying to make people understand what psychiatric problems were. And I'm sorry I don't come up with a name right now, or many names, but they were so helpful in the... How about I'd, Lynn Mowat? Oh, and Lynn Mowat of the Community Chest, who was the executive for so many years, and was all the time that I was four years general chairman for residential, and my 90,000 volunteers, but for the two years, because then he was the executive of the war chest, and for the two years that I was associated cities and towns, Lynn Mowat just was so supportive and so helpful. And, um, and I must tell this, uh, last speech, I was pregnant, and, uh, and I, we had to go to Linwood one night. And I wore a loose-fitting coat. He, I never told him I was pregnant, and I think I was about seven months pregnant. And we had our meeting in Linwood. Then we had to go over to Compton. We had one before dinner and one after dinner, I remember. And in between, then took me to Long Beach to have dinner. And we got back. We finished the second one, and I said, I've made it. And he looked at me in the parking lot. I so, was so surprised. He said, what? I said, I'm pregnant, and I finished my last speech. <laughs> and he, I said he was always so supportive. I never told him that I'd been doing all this <laughs> with a coat hanging around over the top. But he lived was always someone. When I didn't understand something in organizing the city, I could open the door of his office with no preliminary and just sit down and say, why are we organizing out here? It doesn't make sense. Or, and very calmly, he would explain to me some good reasons why it didn't make sense. And he was uh, always so knowledgeable, and he was greatly missed. And I was thinking of so many fields. I get the partnership between professional and volunteer has been so important to me. Not only do I take from their knowledge and their uh, not only their book learning, but their experiences, and can help. And they've been so wonderful helping me as a willing volunteer, hopefully reasonably intelligent to learn, to do things that sometimes they can't do. Um, certain doors are closed to the professional in that uh, they're not supposed to uh, complain to boards directly or there if any staff problems. And they have places that they have to be balked. And so it's, it's been wonderful to have them, to have them as friends, and they end up having them as friends long after they've retired. So my tribute, I pay great honor to those in the social work field with their, there was a period of one time, and there again I was taught this by, I think it was Mrs. Francis or it was Arlene Johnson. And there was jealousy somehow, unfortunately, between professionals and volunteers because they didn't understand each other. And how unfortunate, because while well, certainly the volunteer can't do what a professional does and should be no threat to them, they can do some things. And so it's terribly important to have a partnership with knowledgeable and caring volunteers and the expertise of the professional. So do try to bring those along with you.